Hi everyone, welcome to chapter 11 from unit 3, the post-classical era. This is lecture 1 in chapter 11 about worlds of Islam. So, in this chapter we're going to introduce the chapter and what Islam is. We're going to talk about the birth of Islam as a religion, how it was new, how it also incorporated some older ideas. And we're going to talk about how Islam grew from just being a religion to being a culture, a civilization, an empire as well. So, now, Islam, it's really big. Right now, there are over 1 billion Muslims in the world, a big chunk of the world's population, and almost every country in the world has some Muslims living in it. It's really the fastest growing religion in the world now, actually, among major religions. So it's a religion that's big in terms of geographical influence, and in the last few decades, it's been growing in you know, economic and political importance as well. But this isn't new because it's been around for a long time, since the post-classical era. So kind of like with China, you know, the fact that it's becoming bigger and more important now isn't really a departure from history. It's actually kind of the way it's always worked in the history of this particular civilization. So, now, it was important in the post-classical because it was geographically extensive across most of Afro-Eurasia, and it was responsible for a new civilization that was transcultural. Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam. And when we say transcultural, we mean that almost from the moment it was founded, this was a religion and a civilization that was not really about your ethnic background or cultural background or religious background. If you became a Muslim, if you joined Islam, you were part of the house of Islam. You were part of this bigger thing that was growing. So it's kind of like Christendom in Europe as a bigger thing that was sort of beyond national boundaries incorporated all Christians everywhere. Dar al-Islam incorporates all Muslims. Now, Islam began in the Arabian Peninsula right around the city of Mecca, which obviously now is still very important in Islamic tradition. But the Arabian Peninsula, mostly desert and mountain, but um, trade routes crisscrossed it. There were a few big cities around oases in the desert and along the coastlines. And camel caravans um, crisscrossed the desert, carrying goods back and forth between cities from, the, from inland areas to the coast, from the coast to inland areas. And to the north, there were two major empires. The Byzantines, you know, we've talked about them, the old Roman Empire that had adopted Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and then the Sassanid Persian Empire. This was a Persian Empire that was ruled by the Sassanid dynasty. They were Zoroastrian. They you know, built their empire in kind of the same way as the old Achaemenid Persian Empire from the classical era. Now, um, um, the people among whom this religion began, though, were Arabs. That is the ethnic and language group of the people living right around Mecca. But Arabs were kind of a diverse group of people within that. So because there wasn't like a single country or empire that controlled the Arabian Peninsula, the way you would know like what group you were part of or loyal to was through your tribal affiliation or the sort of big extended family you were part of. And among the Arabs, the word Bedouin referred to the Arabs who were pastoral nomads, who lived by crisscrossing the desert with their camel caravans. And some Arabs settled in these big cities that emerged in the Arabian Peninsula but most were, you know, nomads and lived in this kind of tribal society. And tribes would fight with each other for control of trade routes, for control of water sources. And among the Arabs, there was a lot of religious diversity. Some had become Jews, some had become Christians, some had become Zoroastrian. Some were still polytheistic. And the city of Mecca actually was a polytheistic pilgrimage site. So not only did people go there to trade, but people went there to worship at shrines for various gods and goddesses. And the rulers of Mecca, or the leaders of Mecca, kind of looked at that as a dual source of people and you know, revenue and exchange. That people would go there for pilgrimage to worship at shrines, and hey, they bring some silk with them, they bring some almonds with them, they bring things to trade, and that was good for business as well as for you know, their religion. So, the guy who founded the religion then, Muhammad, he was from the Quraysh tribe of Arabs, and he worked as a merchant, and he lived in the early 600s, early 600s CE. That is when Islam began. 
that is like the moment you need to be able to associate. Early 600s CE, Islam is founded. Now, Muhammad, he married a woman named Khadija, who was independently wealthy, owned a lot of property and wealth, and actually sort of gave him a leg up in his career as a merchant. Now, he was kind of a spiritual seeker. He was not totally satisfied with, you know, the religious landscape that he found in his life. So, he started going up to the mountains around the city of Mecca, the hills, to meditate, to, you know, try to gain some spiritual awareness. And according to Islamic tradition, in 610 CE, the night of power occurred, where Muhammad, while he was meditating, was visited by an angel from God, the one God. Now, the word Allah means God. This is not like a separate title for one particular God. It just simply is God. So you're going to see that this religion, it is very important to understand. It is worshipping the same concept of God that Jews worship, that Christians worship. It's the same thing. And Muhammad then, within Islamic tradition, is just thought to be another prophet. A prophet being someone who brings messages from the one God out to humanity. So within Islamic tradition, there's actually a lot of respect given to Jewish prophets like Abraham and Moses. And Christian prophets like Jesus, they appear in Islamic tradition and in Islamic scripture. But Muhammad, though, is something different. Muhammad is the last prophet, the seal of the prophets. So imagine that you are like writing a letter, if anyone does that these days. You fold it up, you put it in the envelope, you seal the envelope to make sure that no one else can add words to it. That's Muhammad, the seal of the prophets, the final prophet. And part of the teachings, like part of the messages he brought to humanity was this idea that, you know, over time, people sort of muddled the messages they'd gotten from the prophets. People corrupted the original true religion of the one God, and what he was doing was restoring it to its kind of like ancient purity. So, this is a religion that is going to be kind of new and revolutionary, but also really kind of, you know, going back to sort of old religious ideas as inspiration. Now, the message he brings to the people he preaches to around the city of Mecca, in order to please God and be a good Muslim, you need to submit to the one God. You need to, you know, follow Islam, submission to the one God, the same God who was worshipped by Abraham way back when at the beginning of Jewish tradition. And if you did that, and you followed the teachings and expectations that God set out for you, you would be equal to all other believers. So, this was a religion that was very egalitarian and universal. Anyone could become Muslim, anyone could follow the one God, and if you did, you would be equal to all other Muslims. Now, he continued receiving these revelations and preaching, basically just words that were intended to tell people like what God wants from us. So, he started preaching and building up a little following around the city of Mecca, and the local authorities, the polytheistic authorities who wanted the business to keep flowing to these shrines, they drive him out of the city with his followers. And in 622, he flees north to a city that becomes known as Medina. This event, the flight to Medina, is known as the Hijra. And in Islamic tradition, this is actually the moment that the calendar starts counting. Like, this is the beginning of Islam and its history. So, now, while um, Muhammad is in Medina, building up this following, this community starts to come together. And the word Ummah describes this idea that this new thing that is emerging around the leadership of Muhammad It wasn't a tribe, it wasn't a nation or a country, it was a bigger community that incorporated all Muslim believers. And the Ummah was meant to be this kind of like super tribe. And no matter where you were from, or your ethnic background, or what what religion you had converted from, if you became Muslim, you were part of the Ummah. You were part of this community, you were just as good and equal to all others in the religion. So this was a very attractive idea to people, you know, in some of the societies that Islam eventually spread to. 
Now, a few years later then, Muhammad returns to Mecca, takes back control of the city. And there's a lot of debate about exactly how this happened. Did it happen by conquest? Did Mecca just sort of turn itself over to his leadership and, like, you know, see the, the light? But what we know is that Mecca was taken back under control by Muhammad and by his followers in the Ummah. And now you see a big shift happen. Because Muhammad goes from being just a religious leader and a prophet to being a political leader, to being a military leader. And some of the other tribal leaders who had joined the Ummah and joined this new thing that was emerging were also very powerful military leaders and political leaders. And right from the get-go, unlike Christianity, unlike Buddhism, which grew as sort of underground religions, this is a religion that has really powerful political and military leaders supporting it right from the get-go. So it becomes a political state that is expanding, not just a religion that is spreading through missionary activity and preaching. It is a, a community of believers, but also a political system that begins to emerge. Now, um, here's a Persian painting of Muhammad leading other Judeo-Christian prophets in prayer, like Muhammad, or excuse me, here's Muhammad. He's the holiest. That's why he has the most fire around him. But Jesus and Moses and Abraham are all here. So this kind of shows you this sense that he's part of a line from other prophets as well, all devoted to the one God, but he's bringing the most up-to-date version of the instruction book, essentially. Now, when Muhammad dies, though, there's going to now be a dispute almost immediately because Muhammad was kind of a special figure. He was a political leader. He was the guy who was the glue that held the Ummah together, but he was also a spiritual guide. He was the prophet of this religion. So when he dies, it's not totally clear who can take over after him to lead this community forward and even like if there should be a singular leader. But the word for this position, though, caliph, or caliph, or khalifa, these are all ways you can pronounce this word. This is a title that begins to be used to refer to the successor to Muhammad, the one who takes over after Muhammad is gone as the leader of the ummah, of this new community of Islamic believers. And no one agrees about who should become the new leader. Now, for a few decades, though, the people who do take over leadership are among those who actually were followers of Muhammad, those who were friends of his, who were close to him, and had the trust of the Ummah. So this moment is known as the four rightly guided caliphs, caliphs who are looked at as really knowing Muhammad and continuing his tradition directly. But by 661, there's a schism, a separation between two competing groups within Islam over this issue of leadership. On one hand, you have Sunni Muslims who believe that the caliph should be someone who is the most capable leader from among the ummah, who is kind of elevated by the ummah itself to a position of leadership to basically protect and defend Islam and continue to grow its influence. Now, on the other hand, though, you have Shia Muslims or Shiites they believe that the caliph or the caliph should have more of a spiritual role as well. And specifically that the caliphs should be people who were relatives and descendants of Muhammad. So the person who Shiites identified as the one who should have become the leader of Islam was Ali, a man who was not Muhammad's biological son, but was his adoptive son. And he was looked at as someone who was so close to Muhammad that he should have become the correct leader. Now, the Sunnis eventually kind of win out in this power struggle, and Ali, Ali is actually eventually assassinated. And the Shiites become kind of this minority group within Islam that are constantly looking at themselves as a sort of oppressed minority, the ones who really are the true Muslims while Sunnis are kind of the usurpers, the ones who unfairly and unjustly took power from them. And this split between Sunni and Shia is going to be still present today as a major source of 
um, conflict among Islamic countries. So if we look at this map then, in the countries that are predominantly Muslim, you know, most of the countries in the Middle East, Central Asia, North Africa, most Muslims are Sunni. Like 80% of all Muslims of the world are Sunni. But a couple of countries, like Iran and Iraq, are actually predominantly Shiite. And right now, there is a huge sort of political divide between Shia Islamic countries and Sunni countries. And it's not necessarily because of the issue of who should have been the caliph, but this separation turned into something bigger, a sort of more intense rivalry and conflict over time. Now, the core teachings and practices. All of the words that Muhammad was receiving during his revelations from the angels and from God, he spoke them out loud, and they were written down. They were collected by his followers into a book known as the Quran. And this can be spelled a couple different ways. But the language was Arabic, the version of Arabic that was used at the time in the early 600s. Now, the Quran then is something kind of different from like the New Testament in Christianity or the Torah in Judaism. Within Islamic tradition, this is the words of God, unaltered, passing through Muhammad. So therefore, the book itself and the words in them are essentially untranslatable and unalterable and holy. And there has, there has actually been a great deal of resistance to the idea of translating the Quran out of the original Arabic. You know, there are translations available, but a lot of Muslims actually think that that's totally inappropriate, that how could you translate the words of God into something different? So the Quran, though, is kind of the core of Islamic um, understanding about the world and about man's relationship to um, to God. Now, along with the Quran, there are a set of practices called the five pillars of Islam, which are kind of the core of what it means to be a Muslim. And we'll talk about each of these independently in a moment. Now, in addition, though, because of the sort of early years of Islam as something that was under threat from existing authorities... This idea developed early on in the history of Islam known as jihad, which is a word that means struggle in defense of Islam, in defense of the faith. So over time, though, there will be a lot of debate over exactly what this means. It's considered something that's appropriate to do, to you know, struggle in defense of the faith. Some Muslims think this means violent struggle, like military struggle. Like if someone from outside of Islam attacks the religion, you fight back. But it also has been interpreted to mean kind of an internal struggle. That in order to be a good Muslim and live according to God's expectations, you have to resist temptation. You have to fight against temptation and worldly things that will draw you away from the right path. So this kind of struggle is not meant to be violent, but instead it's meant to be you know, a struggle against things that will push you in the wrong directions. So, this jihad has two meanings then. The sort of violent jihad and the sort of nonviolent internal jihad. And this is something that will constantly be a debate within Islamic civilization about which one is better, which one is sort of the true version of jihad. So, now the first of the five pillars, the shahada, the declaration of the oneness of God, where you simply just state, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. This is a brief but really powerful statement of pure monotheism. There is one God only. And in order to convert to Islam, the way to do so is actually by just stating this in the presence of other Muslims and essentially promising, I am now going to be a good Muslim devoted to the one God. The second pillar is prayer, five times a day. Now, one thing to be aware of is that in Islamic society and civilization, the five pillars, they had a very important function as kind of social glue and social bonding, because this was a religion that right from the get-go was meant to be adopted by many people from different walks of life, from different backgrounds, different social classes, different ethnic groups. So the five pillars were meant to be a set of practices that would bring people together and would give them a sense that they were part of something bigger and, you know, very um, sort of inclusive. So prayer 
in, his, in Muslim neighborhoods and towns and cities, when it was time to pray, everybody prayed together, regardless of social class. And the point was to get this feeling like we are all focused on our devotion to the one God together. Now, when Muslims pray, they face the Mecca, or excuse me, they face the city of Mecca, and specifically an object in Mecca called the Kaaba, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, so usually in a mosque or in a Muslim household, there'd be like an indicator telling you what direction you should probably face. Now, prayers happen before sunup, midday, afternoon, sundown, before bed. And no matter where you are in the world or not in the world, if you're in the International Space Station orbiting Earth, you pray toward the city of Mecca. And once again, it's meant to be done kind of in a community to create social cohesion among people from different walks of life within Islam. And because there is this emphasis as well on cleanliness and making sure that when you pray, you do it in kind of a clean space, um, rugs and carpets became a major art form and trade good in the Islamic world. And especially in Persia, Persia was a place where weaving rugs and carpets was already a very sort of big art form. So this demand for rugs and carpets that you could roll out, so you could always have a clean space to pray on, was really going to become big business in the Islamic world. So, um, now, the third pillar is giving alms, or charity, to the needy. Now, this didn't just mean like, hey, if you've got a little money, it's a good idea to give it to people. This was a religious imperative, and social cohesion, and community building. The people who had money, you had to give money to the poor, because that was how you create a sense of unity among all Muslims. Fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. So every day during the holy month of Ramadan, from sunup to sundown, everyone in Islamic communities fasts. And once again, if you live in a town that is Muslim, everyone's in this together. It creates a bond among people. And then you would meet with all of your friends for, you know, a big feast or, you know, a, a meal to break the fast. And then finally, the fifth pillar, and the one that probably is the most obvious in terms of its sort of community building across different boundaries, is the Hajj, or the pilgrimage to the city of Mecca. So, every year, now, about three to four million people go to Mecca during the official Hajj. Obviously, back in the day, it was much more difficult to travel. So it was more of a great undertaking and something that really was a much sort of greater, you know, more extreme spiritual quest. And in the center of the city of Mecca is the Kaaba, this black cube. Originally, this was a polytheistic shrine that contained all sorts of statues and so on and altars. When Muhammad took back the city of Mecca, he went into the Kaaba, cleared it out, dedicated it to Allah, the one God. This is the geographical center of the religion of Islam. So when you are outside of Mecca, you pray to Mecca. When you are in Mecca, you pray toward the Kaaba. That is the center. And when you're on the Hajj, you are there with people from all over the world, all across Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam. And you, the goal is to create this sense of a, a sort of bond and cohesion among people from different groups. Now, as Islam grows, though, under the leadership of the caliphs or caliphs, Islam really kind of explodes out of the Middle East and becomes an empire. Now, the empire ruled by the caliphs is called the caliphate. This is a really important word to remember. This means an empire ruled by someone who claims to be a caliph or caliph. And calling yourself the caliph, that was a really big claim. You were saying, I am the leader of all Muslims, of the entire Bumma, regardless of where they are in the world. So, you know, Muslim rulers who claim that title and say, I am the head of a caliphate, that is a big claim. So, now, the first dynasty of caliphs are called the Umayyads. And under the Umayyads, they were the ones who really expanded Islam. They conquered all basically all of the Middle East. They conquered Persia, they conquered the Indus River Valley, they conquered North Africa, and as they went, people converted to Islam. So Persia became, you know, almost totally Islamic. 
They took over parts of the Byzantine Empire, like Egypt, and that became very heavily Islamic. But by 750, they'd been overthrown, partly because even as Islam grew and became more diverse in these areas, they tended to favor Arabs. They tended to favor like the people who had sort of come with them on the conquests. So the group that overthrows them, the Abbasids, they become the next great dynasty of caliphs. And while the Abbasids are in power, their capital is the city of Baghdad, which is modern-day Iraq. And it becomes really like the biggest and most splendid city in the Islamic world. They become a little more inclusive. They allow you know, people who are not Arabs to rise in the army, in the government, in society. And basically they became a sort of traditional empire like the Persians, like the Romans, in terms of their ability to absorb people who were not from the group that had made the conquest in the first place and turn a really sort of diverse geographical area into, you know, a sort of working imperial system. And, you know, they did things that other empires do. They adopted traditional empire building methods. Like they built roads, they built canals, they encouraged trade, they had a bureaucratic government of officials, you know, carrying out law and so on. But something new was that they claimed divine right, not through, you know, Jesus or through like being the sons of God, but instead, their claim to the divine right was that they were defending Islam. They were doing jihad. They were expanding Islamic influence and bringing the true religion to the people of the world. So, they had some things in common with traditional empires that we've talked about, and they did some things that were kind of new. Now, once Islam became sort of established as an empire, that didn't mean that everyone converted overnight. So, However, it will be the case that by really like, you know, the end of the post-classical era, most people in the Middle East are going to be Muslim. Most people in North Africa will be Muslim. And the reasons why people converted were for all different reasons. Number one, you know, Islam was just kind of the hot new thing. So because Islam was the basis of this new empire that was growing, a lot of people who were conquered, even if they were treated fairly and weren't forced to convert, they just thought, you know what, clearly these people have God on their side, so I will join this religion because it is big. Like, it is clearly correct because look at how powerful these people are. Um, some people convert for political reasons because, you know, they want to move up in the society of the caliphate and have a chance to get better government jobs or just kind of be more accepted by elites, you know, from among the caliphate. Some people join for economic reasons, because as Islam grows, it becomes a trade network as well. And merchants will sometimes convert to Islam, so they can be just sort of, so they can feel like they have a little more freedom to move, and they can sort of interact um, with merchants from a wider area across Afro-Eurasia. And most of the areas that Islam conquered, that the caliphate conquered, were already monotheistic. So it was actually kind of easy to convert to Islam if you already were Jewish or Christian. And in some ways, Islam was kind of promising something that was really attractive. It was monotheism, just like Judaism and Christianity, but it promised a sort of pure version of it, that it was just you praying to God. That was the religion. No church, no hierarchy of priests or bishops or anything. So it was something that was very attractive on a sort of purely spiritual level to a lot of people. Now, within the caliphate then, a new society emerges based on Islam. And this is really where we start to see Islam as a civilization with some unifying forces like religion. In the caliphate, a system of law developed called Sharia or Sharia law that was based on the words of the Quran. So this is a legal system that was based on expectations for behavior that the Quran put out for people. And the Quran, you know, kind of in keeping with this idea of universal religion and equality of all believers, a lot of what the Quran talked about was really kind of like justice and how to treat people correctly and how to be good and honest and fair 
So there actually was a great sort of social justice and egalitarian message built into the Quran that Sharia law was intended to kind of embody as the basis for law within the caliphate. Now, the people who are monotheistic, though, who do not convert, become known as dimis, or people of the book. So this includes Jews, Christians, or Austrians. The caliphate generally had a lot of toleration and tolerance for these people, and they looked at them as spiritually develop. Like, listen, these people are monotheistic. They get it. They're just not all the way there yet. So, they're, yet, they're generally allowed to worship as they please. They're never forced to convert. But there usually is going to be a tax that non-Muslims will have to pay in Islamic empires called the jizya. And essentially, this is based on the rationale that, you know, Islamic people, Muslims, are the ones who are now ruling and defending you so therefore, you should contribute to your own defense and help sort of sustain the empire financially. So this is something that became traditional within Islamic um, empires, starting with the caliphate. And this is actually going to be the one, of, one of the reasons why some people do convert to Islam, basically to get out from under that tax burden. Now, um, the Quran, and as Islam grows, there will be some changes in the rights and expectations for women and men. So one of the things that is simply true is that in the Quran, it says pretty straightforward, like women who become Muslim, women who follow the one God are spiritually equal to men. But there are some differences. So women, you know, they gain the right in many cases to get a divorce a little bit more easily, to get out from abusive or unsatisfying relationships a little more easily. Women are given the right to own property. In Islam, women are given the right to, you know, own businesses. Women are given the right to choose who they want to marry more freely. So in some cultures where women didn't have those rights, Islam becomes very popular among women for those reasons. And it does create more of a sense of, like, liberation among some women. But there are some restrictions, though. Men are allowed to have up to four wives. Women are not women can only have one husband. Now, there's, there has been a lot of debate about this, though, because in the Quran it says something to the effect of men can have up to four wives as long as they treat them equally. Now, some men will argue, well, great, I get to have four wives. But some women argue, though, that that's actually kind of like a mind game, because the whole point is that you can't treat them equally. You can't really make sure that every one of your wives is on an equal level in your mind. So therefore, you should only stop at one because it's impossible to have more than that and treat them equally. But, you know, generally, men were in power, so they went with their interpretation of this. And having up to four wives became pretty common for very powerful men and rich men in Islamic society. Now, also some more restrictive practices that already existed in some of these cultures that um, Islam was taking over seeped into Islamic civilization as well. So um, the practice of making married women wear a veil, that was not something that was originally in Islam. Now, there are expectations within Islam that men and women will both dress modestly. So in a society that was very patriarchal already, like in Persia, for example, wearing veils was something that was done. And in the Byzantine Empire, wearing veils was something that was done. So when people in those areas converted to Islam, to some extent, they just kind of kept on doing the thing that they were doing already. So there will be some restrictions placed on women that in some cases are derived from the Quran, in some cases are derived from the existing cultures that became Muslim. Now, slavery is or was allowed in Islam, but there were some expectations. Like, people were expected to treat their slaves properly and justly. And obviously, you know, not everyone actually did that. Like, being a slave is still bad, and owning slaves is still something that some people thought gave them the right to brutalize them. But the expectation, though, was that you wouldn't enslave Muslims if a slave converted to Islam. You should free that slave. And even women who were owned by men as slaves, you know, men couldn't just take advantage of them. 
they could only have a relationship with a slave if the slave actually consented to it. So slavery in Islam, in some ways it was kind of an improvement from earlier forms of slavery that existed in the Middle East, but it was still slavery. So we just need to keep that in mind. Now, over time, though, Islam diversified and fragmented. So number one, Arabic was the language of Islam, and it spread all across Dar Dar al-Islam. So it became the basic language that was adopted in the Middle East, in North Africa. However, though, it wasn't adopted everywhere. Um, In Persia, modern-day Iran, they continued speaking their language. Persia became kind of a big influence on the rest of Islam because of just how sort of old and powerful that civilization was. Now, the the written language became widespread, though, and um, will in some cases actually be the first writing system used by some of the people who adopt Islam. Now, Islam will will absorb Greek science and math and philosophy, as well as Indian influences as it expands that direction. And in Islamic Spain, after that's conquered by the Umayyad dynasty, that becomes a great center of you know, culture and innovation. And one more group, though, becomes important in Islam. So by about the 1000s, the Abbasid Caliphate really kind of fell apart. And there was still a dude with the title Caliph or Caliph sitting in Baghdad. But increasingly, the Middle East was taken over by people who were known as Turkic peoples, who began as steppe nomads, who migrated and invaded into the Middle East and gradually established their own little kingdoms. Sometimes they were hired by the caliphate as soldiers and then basically just said, you know what, now that we're here, we're just going to take over and kind of rule independently, if that's okay with you. So these separate kingdoms that were based on Turkic rule were called sultanates. And the word sultan in the Turkic languages just means something like ruler or king. So... The sultanates, though, this is really something kind of new because these people never claimed to be the caliph. They never claimed like they were unifying, you know, a single Islamic culture. These were people who were interested in political power and weren't really that concerned about maintaining unity across Dar al-Islam. So this is when Islam really becomes fragmented and decentralized. But at the same time, it will still be a sort of self-contained civilization of Dar al-Islam, even though different types of people will have power across Dar al-Islam. So, Turkic peoples then, they migrated from Central Asia across the Middle East and settled in some areas and became military leaders and political rulers in some areas. So, you don't have to know the names of these sultanates, but a few just examples. In the 1000s, when the Crusades were happening, The Seljuk Turks ruled over most of the Middle East and Persia. There was a group known as the Khwarezmian Sultanate um, that fought against the Mongols when the Mongols invaded in the 1200s. In Egypt, a group of Turks um, set up shop there called the Mamluks, who actually had been soldiers enslaved by the Caliphate who became an independent military force. In modern-day Turkey, The Ottoman Turks settled there, and they were the ones who actually finally conquered the Byzantine Empire. And in northern India, some Turks who became Muslim settled there and set up what's known as the Delhi Sultanate. And the Delhi Sultanate, you know, it was ruled by Muslim Turks, but it was never a majority of the population in India. Most people in India stayed Hindu. So, basically then, by the 1200s, The Middle East and North Africa had become predominantly Muslim, but political power had become fragmented among different Muslim groups, like the Turks and the Persians and the Arabs. Political power in the Middle East and North Africa was held primarily by Arab Muslims, but Turkic and Persian Muslim groups also had held power in some areas. And then finally, large Christian and small Jewish minority communities existed within the Islamic emirates, that's another word for ruler, caliphates and sultanates in the Middle East and North Africa. So, now, test your knowledge, look over this list of words, pause it right here, and just think, what can I say about each of these things? What do I know about each of these things? And here's a set of essential questions to test your knowledge as well. So, that is it for Lecture 1, the first part of Chapter 11. 
see you in class.